All right, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you all so much for coming over. Welcome back to the channel, man. We are on the Grunge channel, and we got the most popular song, The Year You Were Born. I don't know when they're going to start, when they're going to finish, but I'm an 80s baby, so you know I'm excited to see what they got. I know the 70s is going to be where it's at, though. Again, uh, comment below what was your favorite song growing up or or out of these ones they're going to show, you know? What was your go-to song, a song you made a played multiple, multiple times in the day, whether you were cleaning up or just whatever the case may be? Please comment below. All right. I'll leave the link to their channel in the description so you can check out more videos yourselves. We ain't gonna waste no more time. Let's jump right into it. Ever wondered what your parents were listening to the day you were born? Wonder no more. Here's a rundown of music history's biggest hits. Taking a break from the voice blending harmonies found on their other songs, Art Garfunkel takes the lead on Simon and Garfunkel's. So we're starting in 1970, it said. Okay, Bridge Over Troubled Water. I want to see how many I've reacted to, to as well. Bridge Over Troubled Water, delivering a song about the profound power of love and friendship that builds to an almost operatic peak. If you aren't moved to tears by Garfunkel's impossibly beautiful voice, you just might not have a soul. Mm, damn. Three Dog Night may have looked like a bunch of long-haired hippies, but they sang crowd-pleasing, organ-driven pop rock songs, chief among them Joy to the World. Vocalist Chuck Negron powers through this one from the first second, screaming about how Jeremiah was a bullfrog, a good friend of his who always shared his very good wine. I what does that, that even one. mean? Who cares? This party <laughs> classic, written by songwriter and folk musician Hoyt Axton, dominated radio on the pop charts in 1971. Smooth Baby Making Soul was at its peak in the early 1970s, and Roberta Flack's ultra slick and intimate song, The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face, was what? one of the genre's greatest hits. This ballad didn't start out as a slow jam, though. It was written in the 50s by Ewan Mc... That doesn't sound familiar. I might have heard it, but I don't know about the title. McCall, a highly political singer-songwriter. The song became a folk favorite during that genre's heyday, but it wasn't identified with any particular singer until Flack and Clint Eastwood got a hold of it. In 1971, Eastwood used it to score a love scene in his directorial debut Play Misty For Me, and both the movie and song proved popular enough to earn the single a proper release. Somebody was out there. <laughs> Flack's version dominated the pop chart and unsurprisingly the easy listening chart, enough to make it the biggest song of 1972. Tony Orlando landed a couple of hits in the 60s, quit to become a music executive, then returned to the stage in the 70s, backed by Dawn, female singers Joyce Vincent Wilson and Telma Hopkins. Songwriters L. Russell Brown and Erwin Levine based Tie a Yellow Ribbon Round the Old Oak Tree on a story they'd heard in their military days about a prisoner getting released. He wrote to his sweetheart and told her that if she still wanted him after so long, she should tie a yellow ribbon around the tree in front of her house. A timeless tale of drama and romance fueled the song's extreme popularity. It remained at number one for four weeks. Right. Barbra Streisand doesn't seem like the kind of performer who would have scored actual hit pop songs. She's more the Broadway belter, delivering albums, nightclub acts, and Vegas shows. But she's flirted with the pop charts occasionally, finding a niche singing rich, sad ballads like The Way We Were. This release was nominated for Best Original Song at the Academy Awards, even though the movie it came from is actually pretty forgettable. Nevertheless, this was the biggest hit of both 1974 and Streisand's storied career. Really? Husband and wife duo Captain Daryl hey. Dragon and Tony Tennille jumped from Beach Boys backing musicians to a band that churned out love songs for middle-aged married folks. Among their ooey-gooey hits about lasting love and defying the odds, Muskrat Love, Do That To Me One More Time, and of course, Love Will Keep Us Together. I love this this one dominated the music charts in 1975, but Love didn't actually keep the Captain and Tennille together. They split in 2014 after 39 years of marriage. Damn. To me, it's, it should be an intimate, you know, deep, loving connection that didn't happen. While Paul McCartney put out plenty of hits over the years, silly love songs proved that he could be just as much of a superstar all by himself, albeit with the help of his wife, Linda, who co-wrote the song and played Keys and Wings. And that was actually the intent of the song. Paul McCartney says he wrote it in response to critics who said he was content to write silly love songs, in contrast to John Lennon's more serious fare. The world didn't mind, of course, as this song spent five weeks at number one. To this five day, it's still the biggest hit of his post-Beatles career. Weeks? 
Damn. During the 1970s, Rod Stewart built a oh. reputation as a sex-obsessed himbo who released an avalanche of songs about getting it on. Stewart's greatest triumph in this vein was Tonight's the Night, a flirty but weirdly forward love ballad about how tonight is the night that he and his woman are finally going to make sweet, sweet love. Stewart's song likely soundtracked many real-life special nights, and it went on to spend eight weeks at number one, what making doing, it easily Rod? the most popular Damn. song of the year. Disco was so popular in the late 1970s that the world wanted more Bee Gees than the Bee Gees could provide, and Shut so the up, brothers man. Gibb outsourced the job to their younger brother, Andy Gibb. Gibb rivaled his brothers for popularity in 1978, not only because he made the smooth disco hits that the people wanted, but also because he was a super foxy 70s teen idol. And his song Shadow Dancing was truly the let it be of songs about shadow dancing. After I Just Want to Be Your Everything and Love is Thicker Than Water, Shadow Dancing was Gibbs' third straight number one hit and the most popular song of the year. Damn. I'm By the end of the that? 70s, a disco backlash was nigh inevitable. In the charts, this came in the form of the new wave genre, which combined the energy and attitude of punk with the tight musical structures of early rock and roll. My Sharona by The Knack is widely regarded to be one of new wave's finest tunes. The song so shook things up, with its extremely catchy hooks and lyrical wordplay, that the band was actually marketed as the next Beatles, even though they definitely weren't. The next, the next debut album, Get the Knack, was filled with similar gems, but the band never replicated the success and faded away as the 80s took hold. Dang, the next Beatles. All my life I've been, I've been looking for something. Call me. I don't even know what it is. Let me do it like Maybe you're what I'm looking for. The salacious Richard Gere flick American Gigolo launched the Giorgio Moroder penned theme song Call Me to the top of the pop chart for the whole of 1980. And there was no one better to perform this rock meets disco Blondie. tune than Blondie, a band that could handle almost any style of music, from full on disco to reggae to punk. Call Me was the perfect song to bridge the 70s and 80s, too. It smacked of 70s excess and disco, but also contained elements of new wave and offered a brief glimpse of the glitz and glamour of the new decade to come. Kim Carnes is best known for possessing a voice so captivatingly raspy that it's a wonder she could even sing in the first place. While that trait should work for country music, it provided quite the contrast with the hard-charging, synth-driven electro-pop she was required to perform for Betty Davis' eyes. But then, this song is all about the old meeting the new. The song concerns a beautiful woman who reminds the songwriter of Hollywood legend Betty Davis, she of the haunting eyes and striking presence. It's a captivating premise. No surprise, then, that this song became the biggest hit of 1981. I remember reacting to this. Olivia Newton-John took a huge risk hey. with physical. Primarily known up to that point as a singer of easy listening songs, the bubbly Australian singer and Xanadu star rocked a wholesome, innocent persona. But with physical, Olivia Newton-John portrayed herself as a man-hungry new wave sex pot. She tapped into the 80s fitness craze with both this song and its iconic video, in which physical could mean either exercising in a gym or, you know, yeah. the other thing. Yeah, yeah, the combination yeah. of Newton John's charm and the song's strenuous expression of lust was simply irresistible. Physical topped the charts for a whopping 10 weeks, enough to make it the hottest tune of 82. A banger. The police could do it all, from oh. punk flavored numbers like Message in a Bottle to reggae songs like Can This song right here, man, every breath you take. Oh, yeah. I'm trying not to pause this video because it's a long one, but yeah. Mm-hmm. This, they knocked this out the park. Can't stand losing you. But the trio is arguably best known for Every Breath You Take, a spooky piece of melancholy pop rock. On first listen, Every Breath You Take seems like a bittersweet saga of undying love, although a closer inspection reveals that it's actually all about stalking. Yeah. Sting himself told BBC Radio 2 that he thinks the song is, quote, very, very sinister and ugly, but hey, <laughs> it's got a lovely melody, which is probably how it became the biggest song of 1983. Mm -hmm. How good? And again, if you guys don't know, Sting is still getting paid by Puff Daddy for like using that song without his permission or something like that. I think Sting made it made a uh a joke saying that he's put his kids through college with the money or something like that. <laughs> Still paying him to this day from that cuz he used that song talking about Biggie. What does the song have to be to stand out on a landmark album like Purple Rain? Well, it has to be exactly as good as Wind Doves Cry. Oh, how rude of me. I haven't given you enough time to freak out yet. You may do so now. Based on some plot elements from the movie Purple Rain, this song is about sex and love that somehow manages to weave in lyrics about the universal fear of turning into your parents. When Doves Cry features many more trademark Prince touches that were so outside the pop mainstream at the time that listeners couldn't help but pay attention. 
You've got a lightning quick guitar riff, a weird lack of bass line, and of course that climactic keyboard odyssey. Pop music had a big year in 1984, but no other act could innovate like Prince. Nope. Wham! was the biggest boy band of the 80s. Joining affable guitarist oh. and backing singer Andrew Ridgely was George Michael, handsome, powerfully voiced, and very obviously a solo star in the making. Epic Records made that abundantly clear when it released Careless Whisper as a single. Although Careless Whisper appeared on the Wham! album Make It Big and was co-written by Ridgely, it was credited to just George Michael in the UK. In the US and Canada, the song was attributed to Wham! featuring George Michael. A departure from the usual sunny Wham! stuff, this was a hugely successful soft launch of Michael's more serious output, a tune about heartbreak that uses dancing as a metaphor for love. The mid-1980s were the golden age of well-meaning all-star charity records. Boomtown Rats singer Bob Geldof started the fad with the famine relief single Do They Know It's Christmas, which was followed by USA for Africa's We Are The World. Then came That's What Friends Are For, which trimmed yeah, the usual Lord. lineup down from a small army to just four. Well, what a foursome it was. Elton said, if this isn't a number one record, I will leave the business. Dionne Warwick, Gladys Knight, Elton John, and Stevie Wonder put out this cover of a 1982 Rod Stewart song, which became a showstopper that raised $2 million in the fight against AIDS. It also outperformed every other song from 1986. That's what friends are for, indeed. Okay, so real Egyptians don't walk that way, but that doesn't make this any less of a tune. The Bengals' Walk Like an Egyptian is a very 80s-sounding slice of pop rock, and one of the first by an all-female rock band to top the charts. Notably, it took until the late 80s and the efforts of groups like the Bengals for that to happen. Taking the pop world by storm, Walk Like an Egyptian sold half a million copies and hit number one on both the weekly and yearly music charts. After Wham! came to an end, George Michael returned in late 1987 with a new attitude, a new look, and a new sound. Having left behind Andrew Ridgely, Michael reinvented himself as a bearded, earring-toting singer-songwriter of thoughtful pop songs. The first single from his debut solo album Faith was Faith, an all-timer with a melody and guitar-heavy arrangement that's reminiscent of the best of Elvis or Buddy Holly. The world embraced the new George Michael arguably even more than they did the old George Michael. Faith won the Grammy for Album of the Year, and the record produced no fewer than four chart-topping singles. Faith itself spent four weeks at number one in late 1987 hey. and early 1988. Did I hear that one? Very I'm few bands sure. even survive when its famous lead singer leaves for a solo career, let alone thrive, but Chicago somehow managed it, even going on to score the biggest hit of 1989. The group first found success as a jazz rock band in the early 1970s with classic rock staples like 25 or 6 to 4 and Saturday in the Park. Yes. Lead singer Peter Cetera went solo in 1985, and vocal duties fell mostly to Cetera's replacement, Jason Sheff, as well as veteran Chicago keyboard player Bill Champlin. It was the latter who sang on Chicago's only post Cetera number one hit, the breakup power ballad Look Away. Wilson Phillips might sound more like the name of a Montana law firm than a three-woman oh, vocal group, yet they dominated the charts at the dawn of the 90s. There were a lot of girl groups around at the time, but none had the pedigree and marketing factor of Wilson Phillips. All three were the daughters of rock and roll legends. China Phillips is the daughter of John and Michelle Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas, while oh. Carney and Wendy Wilson's dad is Brian Wilson, the musical genius who wrote and performed with the Beach Boys. What? They all had great voices, too, which propelled the first four singles off their self-titled debut album to the Billboard Top 5. Release Me, You're In Love, and Hold On all hit number one, with the latter turning out to be the most successful of all. I'm gonna cut your heart out with a spoon! <laughs> then it begins! The love Kevin theme from Costner. the 1991 movie Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves is performed from the point of view of Kevin Costner's title character. The co-writer Michael Kamen originally envisioned it as Maid Marian's song, and he hoped someone like Kate Bush or Annie Lennox might want to get on board. Sadly, it wasn't to be. It wasn't all bad, though, as Brian Adams was brought in to record it with an arrangement that expressly presented the song from Robin Hood's angle. Everything I Do spent 16 weeks at number one in the UK and seven weeks in the top spots in the US on Billboard's Hot 100. That performance propelled it to the number one position on the 1991 year-end chart. Everything Boys to Men ruled the early 90s pop and R&B oh. charts. Their first number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100, End of the Road, was a soundtrack cut, arriving just after the end of the album cycle for their debut LP, Cooley High Harmony. Songwriters L.A. Reid and Babyface were responsible for producing the soundtrack to the 1992 Eddie Murphy romantic comedy Boomerang. The duo conceived End of the Road with Boys to Men in mind, although Babyface, a star performer in his own right, nearly snatched it right back. Luckily, he relented, and Boys to Men recorded the song during a three-hour studio session on a day off in the middle of a concert tour. Upon release in 1992, End of the Road spent 13 weeks in the top spot, a new record for the charts. 
Arriving in movie theaters in late 1992, The Bodyguard marked the first Hollywood leading role for pop star Whitney Houston. The soundtrack included six Houston tracks, five of which became top 40 hits. The biggest of all, I Will Always Love You, a cover of Dolly Parton's yes. Smash 1974 classic, this 1992 single would dominate the Billboard Hot 100 throughout early 1993, ultimately claiming the number one slot for 14 straight weeks, 14 breaking the chart weeks. record set by Boys to Men a year earlier. Man. When alt rock and gangster rap were enjoying a cultural moment, the I'll say that Whitney cover has to be one of the greatest, though, man. When she hits you with that, nah, boy, hey, she, she, she really did a great job with that one. Top selling single and best selling album of 1994 somehow came from a Swedish dance pop quartet. Composed of three siblings, Jonas, Jenny, and Malin Berggren, and Ulf Ekberg, Ace of Bass formed in 1990. After garnering significant success in Europe, Ace of Bass scored a distribution deal stateside and released The Sign, a song written by Jonas Berggren. It went on the US release of their album Happy Nation, which was renamed The Sign in its honor. After Ace of Bass's All That She Wants hit number two in the US in late 1993, the group released The Sign as a single in January 1994. By March, it was spending the first of six weeks atop the Hot 100. Julio's first hit was a 1994 smash Fantastic Voyage, a breezy pop rap single. In 1995, he returned with Gangsta's Paradise, a song written for the Michelle Pfeiffer movie Dangerous Minds. Extremely bleak and emotionally affecting, Gangsta's Paradise is told from the point of view of a desperate, fearful young street gang member who knows that he's about to succumb to the violence that surrounds him. Sadly, not everyone was convinced. When I let the record company hear it, their exact words were, oh yeah, it's a good album cut. Swear to God they said that. But Gangsta's Paradise spent three weeks at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 and became the number one song of 1995, too. This also marked the first time that a rap song was named Billboard's top track of the year. The original acoustic Macarena hey, appeared on Los De Rio's yeah. 1993 LP A Mi Me Gusta. Record label RCA tried to get Macarena spins in Spanish clubs by asking dance act Fangoria to record some thumping remixes. Instead, Fangoria's Macarena River Remix hit it big in Miami. A DJ for local station Power 96 received so many requests for the song that he sold his bosses on commissioning an English remake of the song. He sought out his friends, a DJ duo called Bayside Boys. They remixed the Fangoria remix, added newly written English verses performed by singer Carla Vanessa, and made the song that spread around the US. The Bayside Boys' Macarena spent 14 weeks at number one and yeah, lived on for years as a party playlist crazy. stable. Reflecting crazy. on the life and tragic 1962 death of Marilyn Monroe with lyrics by Bernie Taupin, Elton John's Candle in the Wind reached number 11 on the UK pop chart in 1974. A live version hit the top 10 in the UK and the US in 1987. Candle and then, the a decade later, something terrible happened. Uh. We have reports from Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. John and Diana were close friends, and after she died in a car accident on August 31st, 1997, condolence books were set up at St. James's at Palace for people to pay their respects. In his memoir, Me, John remembered, a lot of them were writing down quotations from the lyrics of Candle in the Wind. Apparently, they were playing it a lot on the radio in the UK as well. John was then asked to rewrite the song and sing it at Diana's funeral. With days to spare, Topin wrote new lyrics about Diana in 30 minutes. Candle in the Wind 1997 was then released as a charity single. The song spent 14 weeks at number one and went on to become the second best-selling physical single of all time. A dance song about grinding while dancing in the club, R&B trio Next Too Close is certainly the biggest hit that explores the male biological response to external stimuli. While still an unsigned group called Straightforward, the singers approached KG of the rap group Naughty by Nature in a mall one day in the mid-1990s. He generously asked to hear their demo tape. KG then signed straightforward to his Arista Records imprint, Divine Mill, changed the name of the group to Next, and moved the trio out to his home in New Jersey to record an album. One of the songs off that record was Too Close, which spent five weeks at number one in 1998, and would later be heralded as Billboard's biggest song of the year. This song Cher hit number one for the first time in 1965 with I Got You Babe, a duet with their then-husband Sonny Bono. Cher would go on to score a number one hit on one of Billboard's charts for six straight decades. In 1999, Cher landed a Hot 100 number one in the biggest song of the year with Believe, a dance club track that was the first mainstream recording to play around with autotune. He said, I, the next day, he said, you know, I've been playing around with the pitch machine and I think I might have something. 
At the time, producer Mark Taylor and Cher attributed the distinctive vocal processing on Believe to a vocoder, seeking to keep their trick to themselves. After a stint of seven weeks at number one in the UK, Believe began its chart rise in the US in December 1998, reaching number one stateside in March 1999. At the year's end, Billboard named Believe its biggest single of the year. That's all way Released crazy. in late 1999, Faith Hill's hit Breathe fused pop, adult, contemporary, and country music sounds so well that it proved popular on genre radio stations across the country. It went to number one on Billboard's adult, contemporary, and country charts, along with a number two placement on the Hot 100. Because Breathe was so successful in so many disparate places, it wound up the number one overall single of 2000, despite never topping the weekly pop chart. The hook of Hanging by a Moment came to Lifehouse frontman Jason Wade while he was recording a different album cut. Yeah, a lot of this I never heard heard before, at least by the, I don't know about the title. And, you know, shout out to Grunge Channel for not actually playing the song because they, they know their video probably would have got blocked anyway. But I'm just happy that I don't know some of these by the title. Because if I want to go react to them, then I'd be like, oh, okay. Now I remember this. But I, I yeah. Like the Faith Hill, um, yeah, hanging by a moment. It took Wade about 15 minutes to turn that seed into a fully written composition. Interestingly, this could be considered a Christian rock song, making Hanging by a Moment arguably one of the biggest religious-themed singles in Hot 100 history. Christian it reached rock. number one on the alternative rock chart, number seven on the mainstream rock list, and in June 2001, number two on the all-genre Hot 100. Although it never hit number one and arrived in 2000, Lifehouse's Hanging by a Moment is Billboard's certified biggest smash of 2001. Nickelback broke through with their third album, 2001 Silver Side Up. The record would go on to sell 6 million copies, fueled in large part by the first single, the 4 million selling rock radio smash How You Remind Me. Released in the second half of 2001, How You Remind Me made a bigger impact on the charts in 2002, so much so that it beat out every other song to be named Billboard's number one song of the year. As of 2023, How You Remind Me also ranks as the last guitar-driven hard rock song to top the Billboard Hot 100 in either the weekly chart or in a year-end roundup. In 1999, 50 Cent oh, released his first Lord. single, How to Rob, in advance of a full album for Columbia Records. In May 2000, however, the rapper was shot, suffering nine bullet wounds but surviving. Yeah. Columbia quickly canceled the 50 Cent project, and the rapper worked on mixtapes instead, which earned the attention of Eminem's management. Oh man, I'm, I'm really blessed. You know, I'm a lucky person. Two years later, Eminem and his mentor Dr. Dre brought 50 Cent into Shady Aftermath Records and recorded the album Get Rich or Die Tryin'. Because Dr. Dre thought In The Club would make the ideal lead-off single, 50 Cent trusted the industry veteran's judgment. That tune spent nine weeks atop the Hot 100 and led the 2003 End of the Year chart, too. Usher took four singles to number one in 2004, a feat not seen since a Beatles scored five chart toppers back in 1964. The first in that collection, the hard-charging, synth-driven, club-ready track Yeah, a song about making an ill-advised dance floor connection. Yeah was a late addition to Usher's Confessions album. Usher brought in rising rap star Lil Jon to write a lead-off single, and they Luda. made Yeah together. But neither the singer nor producer L.A. Reid were sold on making that the first song to release the radio. However, Lil Jon forced everyone's hands when he sent the song to DJs around the U.S., and the song created a stir in late 2003 before hitting number one in 2004. After a string of disappointments, Mariah Carey's album The Emancipation of Mimi represented a comeback attempt of sorts. The LP was finished and Carey and collaborators were about to enjoy a champagne toast when Island Def Jam Records executive L.A. Reid stopped it. Reid recalled to Vogue, I wouldn't do the clink. I said, this album is not complete. It's missing a big song. Carey asked how to get one and Reid suggested she call producer Jermaine Dupri, who'd worked on the singer's 1995 hit Always Be My Baby. The pair crafted We Belong Together in a matter of hours during an overnight studio session. We Belong Together worked a treat as a comeback vehicle, returning Carrie to the top of the pop chart. In the middle of 2005, the tune topped the R&B chart, the dance chart, and the Hot 100. Not only the number one single of 2005, it was also Billboard's biggest hit of the 2000s. Alright, um, yeah, for the most part, I remember a lot of those songs, um, some of them are on my playlist when I'm working out. I have like a, you know, like a 90s or like a 2000s playlist sometimes I listen to at the gym. But um, I don't know, man. Just seeing music kind of change. Um, 
I just feel like a lot of artists back in the day were more authentic. And today they're just kind of more like follow the leader type thing, you know? Um, they know they can do certain things that's going to bring a crowd to them versus staying true to themselves. You know, that's what I think the, 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 the biggest thing I noticed is missing. I already know. I feel like a lot of y'all, you know, it was the seventies. It was the seventies and then everything else kind of just was like, you just kind of dealt with it. But the seventies. Yeah. I already know most of the people who watch my channel. That's where it was. Appreciate y'all coming over. Shout out to the grunge channel. Um, I'm just I'm just trying to think should I try to check out any of these videos I, I said I don't recognize but I already know what's gonna happen already know but again appreciate y'all coming over and watching man peace out